muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. Yes, loud and clear, Sheikh. Continue. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidi Khulqillahi Ajma'in wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa mutsara ala sabihihi wa nahjih sallam bi sunnatihi wa hadada bi haddihi ala yawmiddin wa sallam tasliman kathira amma ba'd When we look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam one of the things that we realize is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was someone who was very closely attached to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we look at the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we find that Allah azza wa jal placed upon him a great burden and a great responsibility. The fact that he had to, especially at the beginning, single-handedly, call the people to the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and withstand their mockery, withstand their oppression, withstand their persecution. This was a great responsibility that Allah placed upon him. And that's why Allah azza wa jal says, from the very early verses that were revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah said, Inna sanulqi alayka qawlan thaqila. We will indeed throw upon you a very heavy speech because it is a great burden that was being placed upon the shoulders of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's why everyone knows the famous story of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the cave of Hira when he first encountered Jibreel alayhi salam and the first revelation of the Quran. How how he had to go back to Khadija radiallahu anha and how he was afraid for himself because of the burden of what had just been placed upon his shoulders. So the question really is then how did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam throughout this difficult time and when you look at his life you find that many of his companions were persecuted, many of them were killed, many of them were tortured. He, he lost many people who were very close to him, like his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, like his uncle Abu Talib who was his protector, many of his children passed away. He lost many, many people. In addition to all of the different duties that he had as a prophet of Allah and a messenger of Allah and a father and a husband and a leader and a military general and all of these other responsibilities that he had sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam throughout all of this gain tranquility and peace and comfort? How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say stay strong in iman, say stay strong in faith? How did he remain steadfast? And even though we can say that because he was the Prophet of Allah and the Messenger of Allah, Allah gave him that blessing, He allowed him to be steadfast, He allowed him to remain firm and strong of heart. It is also true that when you look at the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us how to do these things as well. He taught us the way to gain that tranquility and that comfort and so on and so forth. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran when He describes the believers, He says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَقْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ There are those who believe and their hearts gain tranquility and peace and comfort with the remembrance of Allah. And then Allah says, أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَقْمَئِنُّ الْقُلُوبُ Indeed, it is only with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts will gain tranquility. And that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did. That is how he gained tranquility. That is how his heart was always a comfort and peace, even when it seemed that everything around him was falling apart. When his companions radiallahu anhum were being persecuted and tortured and killed. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself was surviving assassination attempts. When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions were placed into exile. And then they had to migrate, leave their homes and their families and their wealth and their houses. And go from Mecca to Medina where they became extremely poor people who are refugees, people who are asylum seekers in the city of Medina. All of these difficulties that the people were going through, the battles of Badr and Uhud and the battles of the trench and all of these different incidents throughout the history of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How was it that he continued to be calm, continued to be tranquil, that people would see him as a pillar of strength and then they would take their source of strength from him as well. It was that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gain comfort and tranquility by the remembrance of Allah. And the greatest form of remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jal is the Qur'an and the recitation of the Qur'an. And that is what Allah Azza wa Jal has sent down to us, revealed to us, so that we can have a source of comfort. And one of the best ways and one of the best times in which the Qur'an is recited and one of the best ways in which to recite the Qur'an is during the prayer. 
when you're standing in front of Allah and you're facing the qibla, the direction of Allah, and you're just facing that direction without any other worry of the world standing between you and Allah. You are there only to worship Allah. And you face Allah, and as the Prophet wasallam said, when you pray, Allah Azzawajal turns you, turns to you in return. He faces you in turn. And Allah Azzawajal does not move away from you. He doesn't turn away from you until you first choose to turn away. And that's why the Prophet wasallam, when something would perturb him, when something would sadden or worry him, he would say to Bilal radiallahu an, arihna bis salah, go and make the adhan, let us see comfort with the prayer. And as Aisha radiallahu anha said, that when the Prophet wasallam, would become upset with something, fazi'a ila salah, he would rush to the prayer, not just go to the prayer, not just go and pray, not just find some time out, he would rush, he would hasten to go and pray. Why? Because during that prayer he is close to Allah. He's, he's bowing, he's making ruqur, he's making sujood, he's prostrating, he's making dua, he's making dhikr, but especially he's reciting the Qur'an. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam more or less every single night, every single night he would stand in prayer and he would pray qiyamul layl. He would pray tahajjud, he would pray the night prayer. And it was only a few nights when he was ill or when there was some other reason that he would leave off that night prayer. He would pray it as... Um, as more or less an every single day thing, a daily thing that he would do sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he would spend many hours going and praying to Allah azza wa jal. And he would spend much of the night in the prayer of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he would cry, and he would stand until his feet would have blisters. And he would cry to the extent that the area around him, the ground that he was praying on, was wet with tears. And that's why Aisha radiallahu anha would say, our mother and the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would go for Fajr, after the Fajr prayer, I would touch the ground that he was praying on, the area that he was praying on. And I would find it wet with his tears. Subhanallah, imagine how much you have to cry. Imagine how much you cry, so that it's not just your face that's wet, it's not just your beard that's wet, but the Prophet wasallam, his beard was not only wet, but his, the ground around him was wet as well. Where he was praying, where he was making sujood, the area was wet with tears. That's how much the Prophet wasallam would pray. And when Aisha radiallahu anha said to him, O Messenger of Allah, Allah has forgiven you for all of your sins, past, present, future. You have nothing to worry about. Why is it then that you pray in such a way? that your feet gain blisters, and you cry so profusely. And the Prophet ﷺ replied, أَفَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Should I not be a thankful and grateful slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That is how the Prophet ﷺ sought comfort. And the Prophet ﷺ would not only love to pray and recite the Qur'an and recite the Qur'an to himself, but he would love to listen to the Qur'an as well. And that's why when Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an came, he said to him one day, come and recite the Qur'an to me. Abdullah bin Mas'ud said, O Messenger of Allah, should I recite the Qur'an to you? And it was revealed upon you. He said, I love to listen to its recitation. So he began to recite. Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu an recited. And he recited and he recited until the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, enough, stop there. And Ibn Mas'ud said, then I looked at the face of the Prophet wasallam, and I saw that it was wet with tears. He was crying at the recitation of the Qur'an. There are narrations of other companions, radiallahu anhum, that they would recite the Qur'an. And because they were reciting the Qur'an, as one of the companions was reciting the Qur'an, and he had his young child lying down next to him. And he was reciting the Qur'an in the open, and there was a horse nearby. And as he would recite the Qur'an, the horse began to become perturbed. He would, he would stamp and he would move. And so he would fear for his child, the companion reciting would fear that the, that the horse would stamp on his child. So he would stop reciting or he would quieten down and then the, the horse would calm himself. And then he would again start to recite and again the horse would become excited almost about to trample the child. When the companion mentioned this to the Prophet wasallam, he said to him that indeed an angel was coming from above you to listen to your recitation of the Qur'an. And the horse could see that angel, and because of it, it was responding in this way. And he said in one narration to that companion, if you had only raised your head and looked in the sky, you would have seen the angel or that light as well. And so the companions, radiallahu anhum, were people who also connected to the Qur'an. Despite all of the problems that they were going through, all of the difficulties and hardships, their iman was always strong. Their heart was always tranquil. 
they always had this source of comfort and peace internally, irrespective of what was going out uh, on, uh, in the outside world. Inside, internally, they were, comf- they were uh, comfortable and they had tranquility and peace of heart. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ said to the companions, What is ghina? What is richness and wealth? And then he replied sallallahu alayhi wasallam that it is not dirhams and dinars. It's not money, it's not gold and silver, it's not pounds and dollars. But rather true wealth is contentment of the heart. That is true wealth. And that's why the companions, despite being people of immense poverty, even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, a month would pass by and he wouldn't light a fire in his house. And there were many companions who were homeless, many others who were extremely poor. And despite the fact that they're being attacked left, right and center, and they're going through battles and hardships and difficulties, you found them always a people of comfort and peace. Why? Because that comfort and peace was within their heart. And that is the beauty of Islam and the Qur'an. My dear brothers and sisters, when you have that comfort within your heart, irrespective of what's going on around you, no one can take that away from you irrespective of your wealth, your financial situation, your family situation, situation at university, what's going on with your studies, the problems facing you around the world, all around you. None of that matters if inside you, you have that contentment. No one can take that away. Wealth can be lost, yes. Your family can be lost. Your studies can amount to nothing. All of these problems externally can take place. But if you have strong Iman, and you have that source of comfort and tranquility, no one can take that away from you. That is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the scholars of Islam would say, by Allah, if the rulers and the people of wealth and riches, if they knew what we felt in our hearts, they would come and kill us for it. They would fight us over it. Why? Because that is more precious, more valuable than everything that a person has in terms of materialistic wealth. And even today when you look around you, look at actors, look at politicians, look at musicians, look at all of the people who you normally associate with success, you normally associate with people of, uh, as people of wealth, you find that even though they have all of these luxuries of the dunya, they're still people of de- who are extremely depressed, people who go through so many problems with their families, with their wealth, with all of these issues that they face, drugs and alcohol and so on and so forth. And you would think that if these materialistic um, possessions brought them comfort and peace and tranquility then they wouldn't go through these problems but the reality is that it's not the same those things don't amount up to internal comfort and peace that is only something which Allah Azza wa Jal can give to us and one of the ways that you achieve that is through recitation of the Quran and attaching yourself to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Abu Bakr radiallahu an when he would lead the companions in the prayer he would cry so profusely he would cry so much connecting with the Qur'an, understanding the words of Allah, living those words and verses of the Qur'an, he would cry so much that the people behind him would barely be able to understand his recitation. They wouldn't be able to understand what he was reciting because of his crying. Umar radiallahu an, when he was Khalifa and he would lead the people in prayer and recite the Qur'an, sometimes he would cry so much that the people behind him would cry simply because of his crying. Not because they were moved in the same way at, as, as in those. Uh, not not because they were moved in the same way at the recitation of those verses. They would cry because of the way that Umar radiallahu anhu was crying. So therefore, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, the issue of seeking comfort and tranquility and peace, Allah azza wa jal has told us how to do this. Allah azza wa jal has given us the solution, and that solution is through the Quran, through the Book of Allah azza wa jal. Allah bi dhikrillahi fatma'innul qulub. Indeed, it is only through the remembrance of Allah that you will achieve tranquility, peace, and comfort in your hearts. So, inshallah, this is what we want to focus on today. How do we build this type of peace and comfort? Allah Azza wa Jal in the Quran, in through, throughout the Quran and in many different verses, has told us how the Quran should affect us. Like physically, internally, outwardly, how it should actually affect us. And these are signs that Allah Azza wa Jal is giving to us so that we can then mark ourselves, grade ourselves to see whether the Qur'an is having a desired effect on us or not. And if it's not, then that shows that our Iman is weak, that there is a problem there, that we're not connecting with the Qur'an, we're not understanding the verses of the Qur'an, we're not applying the rulings and the teachings of the Qur'an, we're not living according to the Qur'an, we're not spreading the teachings of the Qur'an. These are weaknesses within us that then we need to correct. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the verses of the Quran, He speaks about how the recitation of the Quran should lead us to climb. How the recitation of the Quran should increase us in humility and humbleness and fear of Allah. How the recitation of the Quran should increase us in Iman and in faith. How the, the recitation of the Quran should bring happiness to us and it should make us joy and rejoice at the, at the recitation of the Quran. How the recitation of the Quran should cause us to want to prostrate to Allah and to glorify Him and to praise Him subhanahu wa ta'ala and to know the majesty of Allah azza wa jal. How the recitation of the Quran should make us fearful for our own state, fearful for our accounting in front of Allah on the day of judgment, fearful because we don't know whether our end result will be good or evil, whether we will be from the people of Jannah or from the people of the fire. May Allah azza wa jal save us from the fire and enter us into Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse number 83, وَإِذَا سَمِعُوا مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَى الرَّسُولِ تَرَى أَعْيُنَهُمْ تَفِيضُ مِنَ الدَّمْعِ مِمَّا عَرَفُوا مِنَ الْحَقِّ يَقُولُونَ رَبَّنَا آمَنَّا فَاكْتُبْنَا مَعَ الشَّاهِدِينَ and when the people, when those people hear the recitation of that which was revealed to the Messenger, you find that their eyes are wet with tears. You find tears coming out of their eyes because they acknowledge and know the truth that has come to them from their Lord. And they say, oh our Lord, we have believed, so make us from amongst those who have borne witness. Allah Azza wa Jal is saying in this verse that from the characteristics and the attributes of a person, who when they recite the Qur'an, they feel that connection with the Qur'an is that their eyes begin to shed tears. And I've mentioned the story of the Prophet ﷺ crying, and Abu Bakr and Umar, and all of these different incidents that we have. My dear brothers and sisters, we need to ask ourselves this question. When was the last time we cried at reciting the Qur'an? When was the last time you shed a tear at reciting the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Qur'an, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَنٍ لَرَأَيْتَهُ قَاشِعًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ الْأَمْسَارُ نَضْرِبُهَا لِلنَّاسِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ If this Qur'an was to be recited, uh, was to be revealed, sorry, upon a mountain. If the Qur'an was to be revealed upon a mountain, and the mountain is one of the most sturdiest, formidable structures and creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if the Qur'an was to be revealed on top of it, it would tremble, and it would crumble out of the fear of Allah. And Allah says, thus are the parables that we place forth for the people who understand, for the people who ponder and reflect and comprehend. And so Allah Azza wa Jal is showing us that this is the way that the Qur'an impacts even the mountains, even the oceans, even the birds and the animals, even the smallest of insects. So then what about us, people who believe in Allah, who accept the Qur'an as the word of Allah, who believe and love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, shouldn't the Qur'an at times move us likewise to this type of emotion of crying? Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Anfal, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Indeed the true believers are those who when Allah Azza wa Jal is mentioned and remembered, their hearts begin to tremble. And when his verses are recited upon them, they increase in Iman, and indeed in their Lord they place their trust. Allah Azza wa Jal is again showing us these attributes that we should fear Allah, our hearts should tremble when we recite a part of the Qur'an that speaks about Jahannam the punishment of Allah, how Allah destroyed past nations, all of them in a single instant, in a single moment how Allah Azza wa Jal has placed torments on Yawm Al-Qiyamah how the accounting will take place, the different, different stages that we will go through this should increase us in our fear of Allah our hearts should tremble out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when we recite those, we hear those verses of the Quran being recited it should increase us in our Iman our Iman should soar because we know and we acknowledge and we recognize that this is the truth that has come to us from our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala Allah azza wa jal says in another verse in Surah At-Tawbah وَإِذَا مَا أُنزِلَتْ سُورَةٌ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَقُولُ أَيُّكُمْ زَادَتْهُ هَذِهِ إِيمَانًا فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَزَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَهُمْ يَسْتَبْشِرُونَ And when a chapter of the Qur'an is revealed to them, they ask, who has this increased in Iman? Indeed, those people who believe, who have Iman, it increases them even more in faith, and they rejoice at these words of Allah. Why? Because Allah has revealed the Qur'an to us. We know it's truth, that it is truthful. We know that it is from Allah. We accept it as being the truth. 
And so we rejoice at these words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We rejoice at the promises that Allah has given to His believers, that they will have forgiveness and mercy and the pleasure of Allah, and that these people will on Yawm Al-Qiyamah be the people of Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Qur'an, likewise concerning these people, قُلْ آمِنُوا بِهِ أَوْ لَا تُؤْمِنُوا إِنَّ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ إِذَا يُتْلَى عَلَيْهِمْ يَخِرُّونَ لِلْأَذْقَانِ سُجَّدَى Say to them, whether you believe or you don't believe, indeed the people of knowledge from before you were those who when the verses of Allah were recited upon them, they would fall in prostration. And that's why we have in the Qur'an times when you recite the verse, you recite certain specific verses, and then you have to prostrate. And even in the time of the Prophet wasallam, because of the eloquence and the beauty and the power of the Qur'an, sometimes even the non-Muslims would fall into prostration after hearing the verses of the Qur'an. The Prophet wasallam was once reciting the Qur'an in the company of the leaders of Quraysh. And he was reciting the Qur'an in the shade of the Kaaba, whilst all of those leaders were sitting there listening to his recitation. And he was reciting Surah Al-Najm, a chapter of the Qur'an from the 27th Juz of the Qur'an. And in Surah Al-Najm, the very last verse is, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Prostrate to Allah and worship Him. And then, uh, it is a sunnah that you go into prostration. You recite this verse, and there is a verse in which Allah commands us to prostrate, and then there is also the sunnah for us to go into prostration. When the Prophet ﷺ recited this verse, فَاسْجُدُوا لِلَّهِ وَعْبُدُوا Prostrate to Allah and worship Him, he went into prostration. And all of those leaders of Quraysh, those noblemen of Quraysh, who didn't believe in the Qur'an, didn't accept the Qur'an as the word of Allah, didn't worship one Allah, didn't believe that the Prophet ﷺ was the messenger of Allah, but because of the eloquence and the beauty and the power of the Qur'an, they too all fell into prostration. That is how amazing the Qur'an is. So then what is the problem when we, as people who do believe in Allah, who do accept the Qur'an as the speech of Allah, who do, be, who do believe in the Prophet wasallam as the messenger of Allah, how come we can't feel that same way? How come in the month of Ramadan, we hear the recitation of the Qur'an from cover to cover, beginning to end throughout that whole month? And we recite the Qur'an ourselves as well. And we hear it on radio, and we hear it perhaps on, on TV, on some Islamic channels. We hear it in the masjid. We hear it on our MP3 players, and our iPhones and gadgets, and, and all of these appliances. But still, it doesn't move us in the same way. And this is something which I wanted to explore uh, in terms of what we can do then to increase our iman. These are the characteristics that we want. We want to be able to feel that our iman has increased. We want to feel the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to be moved to, tear, uh, to tears and crying uh, out of fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We want to rejoice at the promises of Allah. We want to be able to feel all of these things. There are a number of things that we can do that I want to um, concentrate on for the rest of this lecture. Number one and the most important thing is love of the Qur'an, to love the Qur'an. And I know that may perhaps sound as something that we all do anyway, that every Muslim would obviously love the Qur'an. But I don't just mean lip service, I don't just mean that you love the Qur'an, but in, in the sense that you just say that you love the Qur'an, but that you actually, actually love the Qur'an. And so you respect the Qur'an, and you love the Qur'an by reciting the Qur'an, and memorizing the Qur'an, and you love the Qur'an by understanding the Qur'an, and attempting to study its tafsir, that you love the Qur'an by applying its teachings, and then spreading those teachings to others. That is the true love of the Qur'an. Abu Abdurrahman al sulami said, that I met many of the companions of the Prophet wasallam, and it was true of them, that they wouldn't do more than 10 verses, they wouldn't proceed, past 10 verses of the Qur'an until they had memorized them and understood them and applied them. And then they would move on to the next 10. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Qur'an, He, he ridicules those people who even though Allah Azza wa has given them intellect and He's given them a heart and a mind, they still can't understand the words of Allah. Allah says in the Qur'an in Surah Al-Hajj, أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارُ وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ Have they not gone across the earth and seen those people who have minds but yet they do not understand? And they have ears yet they do not hear. Indeed it is not that their eyes are blind, but it is the hearts that are within their chests that are blind. And that is when Allah is saying guidance isn't just that you can see and read the Qur'an. 
Because there are some people who are blind that they can still achieve the blessings of the Quran. That Allah Azza wa is saying that what the Quran should do is it should remove that darkness from your heart before anything else. That is what we try to do and want to achieve from uh, connecting to the Quran and sitting with the Quran. And that is why the scholars of Islam have mentioned uh, and it is also from their lives that you'd see that they were people who would love to come to the Quran. And they would come to the Quran and they would spend their time with the Quran. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu would say that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith that when you go through difficulty, when there is something that is worrying you or saddening you, then there is a beautiful dua that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, all of it revolving around the Quran. He would say, Allahumma inni abduk, ibn abdik, ibn amatik, nasiyati biyadik, maadin fiya hukmuk, abdun fiya qadauk, as'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak sammayta bihi nafsak, aw anzaltahu fi kitabik, aw allamtahu ahadam min khalqik, aw istathabta bihi fi ilmi al-ghaybi indak, an taj'ala al-Qur'an al-Azima rabi'a qalbi, wa nura sadri, wa jala huzni, wa dhahaba ghammi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, that whoever makes this dua, Allah will remove from them all of their difficulties, all of their worries, all of their concerns. And Allah Azza wa Jal will replace all of those worries and concerns with happiness and, and, and things which they are joyous about. And there is a beautiful dua in which a person should say, Oh Allah, I am your slave, the son of your male slave, the son of your female slave. Indeed, my forehead is within your grasp and your rule is over me. And your decree is something which is always just and true. I ask you, O oh Allah, with every name that you have used to name yourself, or that you have revealed within your book, or that you have taught to any of your creation, or that you have kept hidden with the, with the knowledge of the unseen that resides with you. O oh Allah, oh Allah, I ask you with one of these things, that you make the glorious Qur'an the spring of my heart, and the light of my chest, and that you make it, the thing which removes all of my worries and all of my concerns. And this is a beautiful dua that you often hear in the witr prayer, maybe in Ramadan, the Imam will recite this. This is why the Prophet wasallam taught us to love the Qur'an, to go to the Qur'an, and to understand the Qur'an, to recite the Qur'an, to memorize the Qur'an. And these are things which unfortunately we've lost. How many people now memorize the Qur'an and spend time memorizing portions of the Qur'an? Whereas before it was a given that Muslims would spend and dedicate their lives to memorizing as much of the Qur'an as possible, even if it would take years. It's reported in Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, the famous companion, that it took him 10 years to memorize just Surah Al-Baqarah. 10 years! But he persisted and he continued and he wanted to understand this surah correctly and properly as he was memorizing it as well. And so that brings us on to the next issue that we also then need to ask ourselves. That when it comes to the Qur'an, why is it that we love the Qur'an? And what do we want to gain from the Qur'an? Often one of the common questions that I get asked concerning the Qur'an is, is it allowed, for example, um, to have the Qur'an playing in the background whilst I'm working, whilst I'm ironing, whilst I'm busy doing all of these other things? whilst maybe I'm traveling, whilst I'm on the tube or the train or the coach and all of these things. And, and the answer to that question is that yes, it's okay to do that, but the question is, how, what is the respect that we're showing to the Qur'an? If you use the Qur'an as, as like background sound, almost like background music, you just have it in the background while you're doing other stuff and you're not really concentrating to the Qur'an. You're not really understanding the Qur'an. The Qur'an is always a filler. You always listen to the Qur'an when you have nothing better to do. You listen to the Qur'an when you have a few um, minutes to spare and you're on the tube just to keep yourself preoccupied with something. And you're not really listening attentively to the Qur'an. You're not understanding the Qur'an. You're not connecting to the Qur'an. It's just there in the background because you just don't want to listen to nothing. You want something to be playing in the background. And so because we become accustomed to this way of, of treating the Qur'an, the Qur'an has very little influence within our lives. It's like someone, for example, who reads a novel or they read other books when they have spare time. That's something which you just do because you don't have time. Whereas if you're going to read a book that you're studying at university or you're reading a book because it's an integral part of your course, you have specific times when you read that book and you're attentive and you are there with all of your, you know, you're, 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 paying, you're concentrating and you're paying attention to it because it's important to you. That's exactly how the Qur'an should be. It shouldn't just be used as something to do when, when we don't have time for anything else or when there's nothing better to do or when we're just busy 
you know, talking to other people. We just want something playing in the background. This is something which shows the way that we're living and interacting with the Quran. This shows the importance that we give to the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions in the Quran how it is something which we should seek knowledge from, something which we should understand and comprehend. Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Sad, كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب Allah Azza wa Jal has revealed this book to you and it is a blessed book so that you may ponder over its verses and so that the people of understanding may reflect Allah Azza wa Jal says in another verse in Surah An-Nisa أفلا يتدبرون القرآن Do they not ponder over the Quran? And in Surah Muhammad he says أفلا يتدبرون القرآن أم على قلوب أقفالها Do they not ponder over the Quran? Or are their hearts locked up? Allah Azza wa Jal says in Surah Al-Qaf, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَذِكْرَى لِمَنْ كَانَ لَهُ قَلْبٌ أَوْ أَلْقَى السَّمْعَ وَهُوَ الشَّهِيدٌ Indeed, within the Qur'an there is a reminder for those who have a heart, meaning an attentive heart, or those people who understand and they listen attentively. This is what Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to do. And that's why Abdullah bin Mas'ud رضي الله عنه would say that if you want knowledge, then go back to the Qur'an. For indeed in it is the knowledge of those who came before you and those who will come after you as well. And likewise, Al-Hassan ibn Ali, the grandson of the Prophet wasallam, said, Indeed those who came before you would see the Qur'an as something by which they would live by day and by night. So it was something that the companions were, were connected with, that the companions of Allah would spend time understanding and pondering over. And again, unfortunately, this is something which we've lost and something which we need to correct the way that we ponder and connect with the Qur'an. Ali ibn Abi Talib, عنه, the famous companion, he would say, that go back to the Qur'an and learn from it and then act according to that knowledge. For indeed, if your knowledge and your action coincide and they are equal, then there will be no one that is better than you. And this is something again which the companions radiallahu anhum were eager to do. That it's not just about reciting the Qur'an, but it is about reciting the Qur'an, and then it is about understanding the Qur'an and also acting upon the Qur'an as well. And when you have that ability to understand the Qur'an and you apply the Qur'an, you become from the people of the Qur'an. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, who are the people of Allah? Or he asked himself, who are the people of Allah, the special chosen people of Allah upon the earth? He said, um Ahlul Qur'an. They are the people of the Qur'an. And that's why the people of the Qur'an have so many rewards. When you recite a verse of the Qur'an, for every single letter that you recite, you get 10 rewards. Every single letter. Alif is 10 rewards. Lam is 10 rewards. Mean is 10 rewards. And those people who memorize the Qur'an on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, they will be asked to recite the Qur'an and they will continue to increase in stay in, in, in level in, in Jannah for every single part, every single verse of the Qur'an that they recite. And this is why those people who understand and connect with the Qur'an, they can use the Qur'an to even cure themselves, to cure the difficulties that they have. Uh, as Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Qur'an, Ya ayyuhal nas, qad ja'atkum ma'idhatum min rabbikum wa shifa'un lima fi sudum wa hudaw wa rahmatun lil mu'mineen. O mankind, the Qur'an that has come to you from your Lord, uh, a reminder and a cure for that which, which resides within the chests and a guidance and a mercy for the believers. Al-Imam ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullahu ta'ala once narrated a story of him being in Mecca and he was ill at that time but he couldn't find any medicine, couldn't find any physicians at that time and he was in Mecca. So instead what he did was that he spent his time reciting Fatiha over himself. He would recite Surah Al-Fatiha and blow over himself. And he said that I found that it was an extremely effective cure. How is it that he was able to cure himself or, or take some benefit from reciting Fatiha? Very often when we're ill, even if we were to recite it 10, 15, 100 times, it may not have that same desired impact. And that's why Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala said that any medicine has two components. Number one is the actual medicine itself, but number two is the person that it's being applied to as well. The Qur'an is an extremely effective medicine. But if your heart is hard, you don't connect to the Qur'an, your iman is weak, you don't have any connection or respect for the book of Allah, then there is only so much that the, that the Qur'an will benefit you with. Allah Azza wa likewise in the Qur'an recommends that we, um, we surround ourselves with the Qur'an, that the Qur'an is something that we don't just recite on the odd occasion, but we recite it 
during the night and during the day and we recite it every day of the week and we recite it at all the times that were possible we recite it after the prayers we recite it in the night before we go to sleep and so on Allah says in Surah Al-Isra وَمِنَ اللَّيْلِ فَتَهَجَّدْ بِهِ نَافِلَةً لَكَ عَسَىٰ أَنْ يَبْعَثَكَ رَبُّكَ مَقَامًا مَحْمُودًا when Allah addresses the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, and during the night, make the hajjud with it, optional prayers, so that Allah will raise you on Yawm al-Qiyamah in a praiseworthy station. And Allah azza wa jal says to him, Ya ayyuha al-Muzammil, qum al-layla illa qalila. Spend the night awake except for a little part. Nisfahu awin qusminhu qalila. Half of the night, or perhaps slightly less. Awzid alayhi wa rattil al-Qur'an tartila. Or maybe even more than half the night and recite the Qur'an during this time. And that's why the Prophet wasallam, as is authentically reported from him, sometimes he would stand the whole night, and in a single rak'ah, he would recite all of Baqarah, and all of Al-Imran, and all of Nisa, maybe five or six juz, maybe a sixth of the Qur'an within a single rak'ah, without going into ruku, without taking any break. And that's why Ibn Mas'ud, another companion, said that we prayed with the Prophet wasallam. And he began to recite Baqarah from the beginning of the Qur'an. And we thought to ourselves that perhaps after the first 100 verses, he would go into Rukur. But then he continued. And then we thought to ourselves, okay, perhaps after the next 100, 200 in total, he'll go into Rukur. Then he continued. Then we thought perhaps he'll just finish the Surah and go into Rukur. But he finished the Surah and he started Al-Imran. And then we thought, okay, perhaps he'll just finish Al-Imran. And then he recited all of Surah Al-Imran and started Surah Al-Nisa. And now you're going into the fifth or sixth juz of the Qur'an. And he continued to recite and then he went into Ruku'ah. And so the Prophet wasallam would spend much of his night in the recitation of the Qur'an. And he wouldn't become tired. He wouldn't just become, um, become fed up or bored with the recitation of the Qur'an. And often when we compare the situation to ourselves, for example in Ramadan in the Taraweeh prayer, if the Imam makes the prayer slightly long, or recites slightly slowly than usual, then people get in a huff and a puff, they become upset with him because he's prolonged the, the, the Taraweeh prayer by maybe 5, 10, 15 minutes. Imagine how long the prayer of the Prophet wasallam was when he would recite the whole of the Qur'an in such a way. And the Prophet wasallam would look forward to reciting the Qur'an. It wasn't a burden for him. It wasn't something which was a drag. But the Prophet ﷺ would love to recite the Qur'an and hear its recitation. And he would eagerly anticipate the coming of Jibreel ﷺ. And there are authentic narrations that when Revelation would sometimes stop for a few days or longer uh, in certain times during his life, when Revelation stopped for a few days at a time, he would become sad because Jibreel ﷺ wasn't coming to him to recite the Qur'an. And he would love Ramadan because that's when Jibreel would come and he would revise all of the Quran with him, especially in his final year, in the final year of his life, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, when he came and revised the Quran with him twice. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam showed us how we should have this type of love for the Quran. And he would encourage the companions to memorize the Quran. And that's why the scholars of Islam of old, when a person would come wanting to study Islam from them, one of the first questions they would ask is, how much of the Quran have you memorized? Because it showed the determination of a person, their love for this knowledge, their love for the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith in which, uh, which some scholars have authenticated, he said that indeed the one who doesn't have within his chest anything from the Qur'an, meaning they haven't memorized anything of the Qur'an, is like a house which is, uh, which is crumbling the house which is derelict, the house which is falling down. And Sahal ibn Abdullah, he said to one of his students, Do you, have you memorized anything of the Qur'an? And the student replied, no. He said, how amazing is your situation? How can you feel any joy, any contentment, any comfort or peace in your heart if you don't have any of the Qur'an within your heart? And so the companions, radiallahu anhum, and the scholars of Islam would also highly recommend that a person understands the Qur'an and they memorize the Qur'an. And the Prophet wasallam would interact with those verses of the Qur'an, as is authentically reported that when he would be reciting verses of the Qur'an and he came across a verse of mercy, or a verse of, a verse of forgiveness, or mercy, or Jannah, he would make dua for Jannah, and for mercy, and for forgiveness. And if he came across a verse of the Qur'an that spoke about the punishment of Allah and his anger and his wrath and his curse, then he would seek refuge in Allah from his punishment and his anger and his wrath and his curse. And so the Prophet ﷺ would connect with the Qur'an as well. 
So my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, to conclude, I want to remind ourselves again of that verse of the Quran. لو أنزلنا هذا القرآن على جبل لا رأيته خاشعا متصدعا من خشية الله وتلك الأمثال نضربها للناس لعلهم يتفكرون. Indeed, if you were to reveal this Quran upon a mountain, you would see that it would tremble and crumble out of the fear of Allah subhanahu wa taala. And thus, we set forth parables for you, for a people who understand, ponder, reflect, and comprehend. My dear brothers and sisters in Islam. If this is how even sometimes the non-Muslims would prostrate because of the power of the Qur'an and how the mountains react to the power and the beauty of the Qur'an and its eloquence, then what about me and you? Surely it is time for us to also go back to the Qur'an and to recite the Qur'an. As Allah Azza wa Jal says, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَمَا نَزَلَ مِنَ الْحَقِّ Has not the time come for those people who believe that their hearts should tremble out of the fear of Allah and that their hearts should tremble because of what He has revealed from the truth. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives us the ability to connect with the Qur'an, to recite it, to memorize it, to understand its teachings and to implement them and call towards the Qur'an as well. I ask Allah azza wa jalla that He makes, us, makes it a source of comfort and peace and tranquility for us and a means of salvation in this life and the next. جزاكم الله خيرا وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته جزاكم الله خير شيخ اوكي okay. now open the floor for questions please keep the questions related to the topic um, and if you can type the questions into the chat box okay so the chat box is open now so if anybody has a question Please type it in. Um, a question from Sister Fatima. Um, she wants you to possibly repeat the data that you mentioned in your mind. Okay, I think um, in terms of, uh, I mean, I can repeat that dua for you, um, but uh, perhaps it would be easier for you to go back to um, the fortress of the Muslim, that famous dua book, Hisnul Muslim or the fortress of the Muslim. And if you go and check an index there for the dua, um, and I think someone just posted, posted up a link to Zakul Khair. Um, but if you go back um, to that book and look for the dua that deals with anxiety and stress, you'll find that dua in there. And it begins with, um, O oh Allah, I am your servant, the son of your male servant, the son of your female servant. And then it continues on um, asking Allah Azza wa with his names and his attributes. Any further questions? Okay, Sheikh, uh, a question from Sister Hafsa. What would you recommend the best way to go about memorizing the Quran, especially on your own? Um, I think one of the, the best ways to memorize the Quran is, um, is to find a good time in which you can memorize the Quran. So perhaps choose like the early part of the morning after Salatul Fajr and get into a routine that you stick to every single day, irrespective of the situation. Um, even if you're busy with studies, with family, you know, you're on holiday, always have the time that you dedicate to memorize the Quran, be that five minutes, be that half an hour, be that an hour, whatever it is that you can do. One of the other things that I would recommend is that you have a teacher uh, or someone that, that can place some pressure on you, that can hold you to account, that you know that you have to then go and recite to as well, and that teacher will also correct your mistakes and help you with the recitation of the Quran as well. So, um, I mean, these are just a couple of tips. I mean, that, that really is a whole lecture in and of itself. But um, the most important thing is to start, even if you start small, but have a, a routine and have a, a timetable which you follow and then stick to that, inshallah ta'ala. Um, 
Um, next question from Sister Sadia, who asks if you could please give some a uh, few practical examples that may lead us to enlighten our hearts towards the Quran. My greatest piece of advice for this is that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this blessing. For indeed, um, any type of knowledge, any type of guidance, it is a blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which He only gives to whomsoever He wills. This is something which Allah Azza wa Jal gives to whomsoever He wills. It is a gift that Allah gives. And so therefore one of the best ways to achieve the gifts and the blessings and the favors of Allah is to make dua for them and to ask Allah Azza wa Jal for those blessings and those gifts. So ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He gives you the ability to understand the Qur'an. Um, and that's basically even the dua that we just spoke about a few minutes ago. That's what it's asking, that the Qur'an becomes the light of our hearts and it becomes um, the spring of our chests and so on and so forth. These are so that the Qur'an will, um, inshallah, or we will be connected with the Qur'an rather. So that would be my greatest tip, that you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. And then obviously the other things that you can do is... To, um, to understand the Qur'an as much as possible, to understand its meanings, to study its tafsir so that you can appreciate it more, um, its wisdoms and, and, and its deep meanings, that would also uh, benefit greatly, and Allah Azza wa Jalla knows best. Um, next question from Sister Maryam, who says, Jazakallah khair for the verse, it was very insightful, alhamdulillah. There is some contention surrounding if women are allowed to listen to the Qur'an in an audio format when they are experiencing their menstrual cycle. Please can you shed some light on this? In terms of this issue, what is not allowed for a woman to do on her monthly cycle is to touch the physical Qur'an. And what we mean by the Qur'an is the Arabic Qur'an, um, not the translation of the Qur'an, not a book that has Qur'anic verses in it, but the Qur'an itself, the original Qur'an. It is not allowed for a woman to touch the Qur'an during that time. It is allowed for her to listen to its audio. Um, as for its recitation from memory, then the scholars have differed over this. Some said yes, some said no. Um, but I think if it's um, for like learning purposes or a person revises the Qur'an so that they don't forget it, then inshallah there's no harm in that. But to listen to its audio, um, there's no harm in that inshallah, there's no problem with that. Um, next question, a question from Sister Sana, who says, uh, As Imam Ghazali, Rahimullah said, it is better to learn three verses and implement them rather than memorize the whole Quran without understanding. Um, and also, what book of the seed would you recommend? Uh, in terms of the statement of Imam Ghazali, we mentioned that even the companions of the Prophet وسلم, would just take ten verses before they would move on, understanding them and applying them and memorizing them and so on. Um, so that is similar to that, I mean, how, how exactly how many verses you take on a daily basis or however often you take them is um, would depend on your individual situation. And so it's not just that you have to take three or ten or a specific number, that goes down to the individual. In terms of the book of Tafsir, um, there are many good books of Tafsir, um, but probably the most accessible one in the English language um, that is also very good is probably going to be Tafsir ibn Kathir. Uh, of the great scholar of Islam Ibn Kathir ta'ala, which is probably one of the most famous and um, most widely referenced books of tafsir uh, I'm not actually sure how what other books of tafsir I'm not familiar with many of them in the English language but I know that Ibn Kathir the abridged version has been translated into a number of volumes um, so that's basically the one that I would recommend and next question from Bin Ahmad um, are there any specific good English translations or explanations of the Qur'an that you would recommend? Uh, so in terms of explanations or tafsir, um, I just mentioned Ibn Kathir. In terms of English translations, then the one that I normally use and I found to be very um, very easy to read and is, is very good flowing is the one that's been published by Sahih International. Um, that's S-A-H-W-E-H International, Sahih International. Um, I know that there are others available as well. But this one seems to be the one that's, that the English is most flowing and it's not like an archaic type of English like you get in the use of Ali or the pictorial versions. Um, so that's the one that I normally use. Salam, is there a dua for 
only stability and unity? Um, one of the du'as that you can mention is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Qur'an at the end of Surah Furqan رَبَّنَا هَبْ لَنَا مِنْ أَزْوَاجِنَا وَذُرِّيَّاتِنَا قُرَّةَ أَعْيُنٍ وَجْعَلْنَا لِلْمُتَّقِينَ إِمَامًا O oh Allah, provide for us or give to us from ourselves, from our spouses and our children those who will be a coolness for our eyes and make us leaders for the righteous and the pious. And so that's something, um, that's a dua that is, if we put Surah al in, uh, in the Quran, it is towards the very end of that surah, one of the final verses of that surah. And that is a dua that you can use, and Allah knows best. Okay, um, another question from Sister Sana, who asks, Look at the sea with multiple meanings, which one do you take? And also, which translation of the sea from Ibn Kathir? In terms of um, tafsir, where, for example, the scholars may differ over its different meanings uh, of exactly what the tafsir of that verse is, then again I would recommend that you go back to a book like Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, because what he often does is that he will mention those different opinions of the scholars that they had or the different interpretations that they give and then he will uh, normally choose what he believes to be stronger or he will combine between them and say that in reality there's no difference of opinion here or there's no contradiction but they're all just referring to a different part of that verse. Um, and in terms of the translation of Ibn Kathir uh, then I would recommend the Darus Salam publication uh, which is the one that's been printed in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, and I think it's, I'm not exactly sure, but I think it's about five, six, seven volumes, something like that. So it's the Darus Sanam publication. Okay, um, a question from Sister Fatima who asks, Is there any dua in the Quran you can recite when doing dua for someone's guidance? Um... Someone else's guidance. I can't think of one from the top of my head, um, other than the general du'as that you make just for guidance. Um, I'm not sure. But you, even if it's not not not, not specific du'a um, from the Quran, you can make du'a generally anyway yourself, and you just ask Allah Azza wa Jal for the guidance. And Allah knows best. Um, I think we'll take one more question because uh, as time runs out. Um, okay, so Sister Sana asks, how do you start to gain deep love for the Quran, for the Book of Allah? Uh, that was basically what the whole lecture was about. So I think you need to go back and inshallah uh, revise that lecture. Basically, that's what we were trying to focus on: how to gain that deep love of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by reciting it, by memorizing it, by understanding its verses, uh, by making dua to Allah that He grants you that uh, that type of love for the Qur'an. Um, and when you increase your iman and you connect with the Qur'an in that way, then inshallah your love for the Qur'an will also become deeper as well, and Allah knows best. Okay, um, I think we we'll stop there. Uh, questions and um, any closing comments here from yourself? Uh, nothing more than what we just mentioned in the lecture that um, really like it is a it is a duty for all of us uh, that we go back to the Quran and we reconnect with the Quran for it is one of the signs of Yomul Qiyamah that knowledge will be lifted from this Ummah and also the Quran as well that the knowledge of the Quran will also be lifted as well and there will come a time as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when people will not know from Islam except very, very little. And so they won't understand the Qur'an and the Qur'an will be lifted, the actual Qur'an will be lifted, that is also from uh, the signs of Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And so um, it is a, the duty of every Muslim really, it's not something to do with any country, it's not something to do with any rule or organization. This is a duty that we, all as Muslims, have for ourselves, for our own benefit and our own families, um, You know, whether that be parents, siblings, spouses, children, whoever they may be, that we want to connect with the Qur'an as well. And connecting with the Qur'an, as I said, has many great benefits, um, but especially benefits to do with contentment and, and peace and tranquility and comfort, and that will help you with, despite all, any of the problems that you may be facing 
in the external world, internally they will give you, inshallah, a lot of comfort and peace and tranquility. And ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He grants us that type of comfort through the Quran. And jazakum khair again for um, folks for putting on this uh,